Ecclesiastes chapter 9. It's where we're going to uh, take our thought for from this morning. Uh, we're talking about renewing your vows. Renewing your vows. And we're going to do that on this morning. We're going to say something to encourage us. Talk to the married folk and we're going to talk to the single people. And then we're going to have our married couples to come up on the stage. Uh, so if you kind of had a dispute this morning, I'm going to ask you to grin it out. <laughs> you got to look at each other today. And we're going to have a recommitment to each other and to the Lord. And then we're going to bring our single people up. And we're going to have a recommitment to the Lord. Is that all right? All right. The book of Solomon, in his old age, uh, Solomon had now uh, recovered uh, from his backsliding. And here he dictates his observations and he writes about his own experience. And he simply says that old age should bring about wisdom. And so he teaches us about life. Solomon simply says, all is vanity. Our resolve is simply to fear God and to keep his commandments. Solomon said that one thing in life is that we fear God, but we also can enjoy some of the gifts that God gives us. And one of those gifts is that of marriage. And we're going to look at that on this morning, and we're going to see uh, what the text has to offer us from God. And one of those is marriage and live joyfully and cheerfully with the whom thy love. And so in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verses 7 through 9. Well, what is a vow? A vow, a vow renewal is a way to celebrate your commitment. Perhaps you made it to two years or five years, 10 years or 25 or 50 years together and you want the world to know uh, you do it all over again in a heartbeat. Now maybe you fall in that special category or perhaps uh, you've had some struggles along the way where you want to reaffirm your commitment to each other after a rough period in your relationship. I want to say to each situation, rather you are overflowing with joy on this morning or wishing you were somewhere else with somebody else. You are in need of a vow renewal. It doesn't matter if all is gravy right now and all is in disarray. We all at some point need to reaffirm our love to each other and to God. The process of renewal is something we all need. Rather, we are married or single. We all need to uh, return uh, to what once was. Come back together again. Begin again. Reestablish again. Restore again, refresh again, rejuvenate again, make it like new again. And I want to show us that no matter the length of years, how much money you may have or don't have, if you got a six pack or a keg, it doesn't matter at this juncture. You may have an hourglass figure or a gallon of milk figure. Whatever you have on this thing, 
This renewal vow is not only important for the married couple, it is just as important for the single person. While we will focus on couples renewing their vows, the single person in here needs to renew their commitment back to God. And I want to encourage you that all of us, despite where we are in our walk in life at this time, we need a refresher to remind us who God is and what he has blessed us with. And we're going to talk about that on this morning. Y'all all right? Amen. Three points and uh, the lesson will be yours. We're going to talk about detachment. And we're going to talk about being attached. And we're going to talk about love that bounds us. In order to renew then that simply means that something had to be taken away detachment has taken place a separation from our original vow or commitment has done just that the question is what separates us and how do we become detached what is it that steps in and moves us away from the vow and commitment that you and I made on the day that we got married. Y'all all right? I need a microphone. Now, this is a little hard medicine. It's hard because not only does it hit you, but it also hit me as one who has to deliver the medicine. When I was younger, uh, my mother, and I've shared this before, uh, for whatever reason, she used to force, force us to take two of the most hideous medicines they could have ever created. And that was castor oil and cod liver oil. And mom used to line us up <laughs> with the biggest spoon she could find and say, so, y'all shaking right now, I'm already sweat thinking about that cast oil and live oil. And, and she used to force it down our throats to take. Uh, although I hated taking it, it was tough to receive, but the outcome was necessary. The benefit from taking hard medicine uh, is to prevent some things from happening. And so we're going to talk about what is it that can detach us from each other. And so let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter seven, chapter nine, verse seven through nine. We're going to read the text and then we're going to, the lesson is going to be yours. The Bible says, and I'm going to read from the contemporary English version. And it says in verse number seven, so be happy. And enjoy eating and drinking. God decided long ago that this is what you should do. Dress up, comb your hair, and look your best. Life is short, and you love your wife, so enjoy being with her. This is what you are supposed to do as you struggle through life on this earth. Solomon says, he says that all is vanity, but he said there are certain things that God has gifted us that you and I ought to enjoy while we are here on earth. And he says that marriage is one of those enjoyable things. But the question is, what separates us or what detaches us from our commitment or the vow that we made during that time of bliss. And so let's talk about that. So, there are things that happen along the way. In order to detach us from our commitment, detachment is designed to distance or to make us stand off I can separate you and if I can accomplish separating you then I can hurt you and I can wound you 
So the design for detachment is not only to pull us away, but it can hurt us and it can wound us. And when it hurts us and wounds us, it has done what it has set out to do is to move us away from a commitment that you and I made as husband and wife. Y'all all right? All right. So, but what are some of the things that can do this? Finances. When your money is absolutely hysterical. That can separate couples when you are all the time fussing and arguing about money. Y'all looking strange. I, I ain't going to stay long, y'all. Listen, if your money is not just funny, but we said absolutely hysterical, that when every time you look into your account and you try to want to do something, your account look back at you and say, ah! You playing today. <laughs> you can only take that for so long. And if one of you who are in the relationship is bad with money management, it can put a strain on your marriage. It can put a strain on your mar marriage. It can rip it apart. Because you cannot control yourself. Impulse spending. Every time you walk into a store, you got to get something. Oh, y'all looking like, okay. Your body structure changes. What are you talking about, preacher? At one point when y'all first met, she used to be able to take a quarter and a dime and bounce it off your... <laughs> now she hit you in the sticks. <laughs> you ain't slim fast no more. <laughs> now you walking around, when you fall down, you take a little bit of time to get up. You ever rolled up? <laughs> Y'all look at... I'm telling you. These things can detach us from our vow. And know what? It, it affects us up here. When you are used to something and it begins to change in your relationship, when you are not in a good spiritual place, it can hurt you. Listen, I'm trying to help you single people. We'll talk about y'all because y'all all want to get married. Listen, there's some things that happen in there. And you be like, oh! But you got to deal with it. When your body, listen, listen, she may have a, what we call it an hourglass figure in the beginning. But when, it's, when they have children and things begin to change about them, you know, we want them to have kids. Babe, I want you to have my son. I want a son. I want this and that. But when they start stretching all out of place, I'm trying to help her see some things. Some of y'all can attest to what I'm saying. Some of y'all, no, nah, I ain't like, yes, you are. You don't feel the same way anymore. Okay. So, right, point one, we're going to keep moving. Intimacy declines. What do you mean? Part of that body structure changes. What happens when intimacy declines in your relationship? When illness sets in, a sickness sets in. There was a preacher who shared a story about a couple that got married. And on their way to their honeymoon, they had an accident. And the wife became crippled and paralyzed from the neck all the way down. Who stays? I married you to enjoy the fruits of marriage. What do you do now? When you can't experience that with your partner anymore. Now, look, this, is, this is reality. This is what we're dealing with. 
What happened when intimacy declines in the marriage? J.K. talked about that a little bit on Wednesday. What happened when we start starving each other? You look for other places to get fed. Oh, y'all don't want to yeah, That's all right. That's all right. I know you're listening. Intimacy. When sex declines in marriage, it begins to separate us. It cripples marriage. It detaches us from those vows that we made through sickness and health. It's one thing when we're standing before the audience and we're spewing these vows and we're all lists and we're smiling and we're laughing and then something tragic happened in the midst of our marriage that we didn't plan for. It's one thing to say to death do us part and then in the process they don't physically leave us but something cripples them in our process. What do you do then? How do you stay with them? when you desire to be with them physically and they can't perform with you. What do you do? Several of us have given up on situations like that. Glad I got your attention because I want us to see this is what can detach us from those vows. Intimacy and infidelity can detach us Remember, marriage was never designed to divorce. Amen. It was never God's initial intentions. But life happens and things happen. But what happens when one cheats on you in those marital vows? These can detach us. And some of us look for ways to get out. Some of us don't got nothing to do with infidelity. Some of us say, you just can't cook right. I don't even want to go back home no more and eat. <laughs> you burn up everything. <laughs> All right, y'all. <sighs> <Amen. laughs> Friends and uh, people who mean you no good get between your marriage who are not successful in theirs try to tell you how to be successful in yours you never could understand that could you you don't know how to save a dollar but you're going to tell me how to save one <laughs> you are suffering in the same areas I'm struggling in but you got all the answers Oh, Lord, have mercy. These things detaches us from our vow. Forgetting your first responsibility. What do you mean? Sometimes we get so caught up in trying to help others that we forget our first church. Well, what is your first church? Your family. Brethren your wife and your children are your first responsibility. That's why the Bible says you can't not lead God's house if you can't lead your own house. We try to serve everybody else and we forget the responsibility of our own home. You can't do it. It detaches itself. It separates us. It hurts us in our vows. Not leading our family, but God, but chasing everything else. No more excitement. You stop dating each other. Children happen. As much as we want kids and we love our children when we get there, we still are responsible to who? To your spouse. We are responsible to our spouse. But some of us have a hard time doing that. We replace them with our children. It's all right. I know you're listening. So, children emerge stress from work. Someone else grabs your attention. These are just a few things that tears the vow apart. 
And so while I'm here, I want to say something to those who are single, who are struggling somewhere uh, in our teaching. We somehow have made it, uh, made it seem as if, if you are not married, that you are unimportant in the kingdom of God. And that's not so. Somewhere in our uh, efforts uh, to talk about marriage, that we've made it as if it is a sin to be single in the Lord's house. And that's not so. We made it as if that everybody has to chase down to have a mate in order to be successful in the kingdom of God and to have value in God's house. But that's not so. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, uh, verses 25 through 38. And I want to show you what Paul has to say uh, to us, to encourage us. If you have it, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 7, uh, verse 25 through 38. Uh, God can use us. And he can use you being single. And there's nothing wrong with being single. And there's nothing wrong with being married. But wherever you are, you have to find value in where you are. And you have to remember the vow that you made to God when you became a member of the Lord's church. So what does the Bible say in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 25 through 38? I don't know of anything the Lord said about people who have never been married. Uh-huh, keep reading. But I will tell you what I think, and when you can trust me, because the Lord has treated me with kindness. We are now going through hard times, and I think it is best for you to stay as you are. If you are married, stay married. If you are not married, don't try to get married. <laughs> <laughs> Some of y'all right I like that reading. <laughs> Listen, this is Paul, and, and he's, he's, he's dealing with some issues that the Corinthian church was facing. And he wanted to address these issues. Now, Paul doesn't speak against marriage, and he doesn't speak against being single. What he tries to do is encourage us where we are. And keep reading. What does it say? It isn't wrong to marry, even if you have never been married before. But those who marry will have a lot of trouble, and I want to protect you from this. Oh, Lord of mercy. My friends. Even Paul said there was trouble in marriage. My friends, what I mean is that the Lord will soon come, and it won't matter if you are married or not. It will be all the same if you are crying or laughing, or if you are buying or are completely broke. <laughs> it won't make any difference how much good you are getting from this world or how much you like it. This world as we know it is now passing away. I want all of you to be free from worry, and an unmarried man worries about how to please the Lord. But a married man has more worries. He must worry about the things of this world because he wants to please his wife, so he is pulled in two directions. Unmarried women and women who have never been married only, wor only worry about pleasing the Lord, and they keep their bodies and minds pure, pure. But a married woman worries about the things of this world because she wants to please her husband. What I am saying is, for your own good, it isn't to limit your freedom. I want, I want to help you to live right and to love the Lord above all else. That's good, Chris. Listen, 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 listen at the warnings. Those of us in marriage, we there. And we can attest to what Paul is exactly saying. We spend most of our times trying to please our spouses. We want to make sure they're happy. Proverbial writer tells us about having an un, unhappy wife in the house. <laughs> You'd rather be on the top of the roof. <laughs> Living outside than being in a house with a wife that's upset. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with being single. And if you are in that category, God can use you. Your vow is to God. He needs to be your man and your woman at that time. Well, what separates us as single people from our vow is when we live like we married. Yeah, I thought I was just going to deal with it. Listen, when you do everything a married couple does and you're not married, when you experience an intimacy and you're single. You are 
disrespecting your vow to God. Y'all looking strange. That's all right. <laughs> you eating all this apple pie. And when you decide to get your apple pie, you have a hard time. You know why? Because you got all these other flavors that you've already tasted. You know what's interesting to me? Is how when we live in sin, ask God to bless our relationship. What God are you talking about? God doesn't bless sin. You can't live in sin in a relationship and say, God bless this relationship. Y'all look, listen. You, you, that has separated you. You can't be spending the night and sleeping over. Carrying on like you married. And then getting up here boohooing and crying when your relationship is in the dumps. And saying, God, I want you to bless this thing. That's an insult to God. Because you are asking him to bless a sinful situation. All right. So. Let's move on, y'all. I don't want to keep talking about this now. But you know we carry on like we're married. You, you, you're buying things together. You're doing all type of things together. Paul said your attention should be on God. He's encouraging you. There's nothing wrong with where you are. Serve God and love God first. And he can take care of all those wants and needs that we have. You just got one person to deal with now. You get married, it's two of y'all. They got to deal with your issues. So, just want to drop that by. The process of attachment. We move in good time. Listen, to connect. Hosea in chapter 2, verses 16 through 20. We talked about detachment. Now we want to talk about attachment. What can bring us back? The process of attachment is to connect. In Hosea chapter 2, verse 16 through 20, the Lord's love for his people. What Hosea was instructed to do was to marry a harlot by the name of Gomer. And she consistently cheated on him. But God wanted to remind him that I want to make a new covenant with Israel. Well, how are you going to do it? I'm going to teach you through you making a new covenant with your wife, Gomer, who continues to break her vows that she made, it with, that she made with you. It was broken because of Israel's sin and because of other gods. Goma cheated on Hosea. Now he has, God was saying, listen, I love Israel enough that I'm not going to throw her away. But I'm going to give her a chance to come back and renew that commitment that she first made with me. And I want you to do the same thing with your wife. Now, she has disrespected the marital vow. And she has done all that she could to separate herself from you. But I want you to restore yourself to her. How do you do? I want you to recommit to her the vows that you made. I know it's not going to be easy. And it's not easy when you're dealing with struggles in your marriage to come back together the way God wants us to do. Most of us want to run away from all that pain and hurt that we're dealing with. But it was never God's intention from the beginning. And God said, listen, I want you to renew yourself, not only to your spouse, but it allows you an opportunity to renew yourself to me. Well, how do we do this? It's the love that holds us together. Go to Proverbs chapter 5 verse 18 through 20. We're almost wrapping up now. We're almost wrapping up. And we're going to do a little something up here uh, to make that recommitment. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 18 and 20. What does the Bible say? Let your foundation be blessed. Let your foundations be blessed. And rejoice in the wife of your youth. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. 
as a loving hind and graceful doe. Let her breast satisfy you at all times. Listen, listen. Keep reading, Doc. Re slow it down. Too. Don't rush through this okay, now. Okay. <laughs> because he's trying to give us some instructions on how to stay committed to the vow that you and I made with each other. Now, slow it down. Do a little reverse. Now, this is us teaching. Now, it's funny that when we get to talking about stuff like this in the church, everybody want to cringe. But as soon as you get in your car, you put on all type of slapping and back, slapping music that you want to think about. <laughs> yeah, that's this. <laughs> and it teaches all sorts of things. And we have no issues with that. Now, slow down because the proverbial writer, he's trying to tell us something. That's beneficial to us. Now, what does it say? Lee? Let your fountain be blessed. Let your fountain be blessed. How are you going to bless it? And rejoice in the wife of your youth. Uh-huh. As a loving hind and graceful doe. Let her breast satisfy you at all times. Be exhilarated always with her love. For why should you... In other words, what you got at home should be good enough for you. Amen. Enjoy all that she has. <laughs> It's for you. Don't be looking strange. It's for you. Y'all looking like y'all understand that. You want to slap her a little bit back there? That's for you. That's yours. Y'all looking strange. Listen, listen y'all acting funny. But the scripture is teaching you the reason why some of us stray away from home because we don't enjoy what we got at home. Hey. It's yours. For Some of y'all do more than that. Don't be acting strange. Got a handcuffs and all kinds of stuff you playing with. Yeah, see, amen and amen corn. Listen, you better learn how to enjoy what you got at home. It is God's gift to you. If you want to lose that gift, let somebody else start enjoying what you got. If you ain't going to remind her how beautiful she is and what she make you feel like, there's somebody else waiting that will. You might don't whisper sweet nothings to her anymore, but there's a coworker who can't wait to see her come into the office. And notices all her fragrance and different styles that's going on. And while you out whispering somewhere else, somebody else is whispering. And people can say what they want to say. You don't know what you are capable of doing until you are put to the test. I've seen the strongest people that I've admired fall because we front like we don't deal with those issues. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Keep reading, Lee. Okay. For why should you, my son, be exhilarated with an adulteress and embrace the bosom of a foreigner? Y'all know that, you, you know what he's saying, don't you? You got something at home, it ain't good enough, you're going to get it somewhere else. Okay. I know you hear me. <laughs> We're going to stop pounding on them. They're getting, that's too much. We're getting sweaty up here. <laughs> Let's go to Proverbs 12 and 4, and then Proverbs 17 and verse 4, and then we're going to get ready to bring this to a close. Proverbs 12 and 4, what does it say? An excellent wife is the crown of her husband, but she who shames him is like rottenness in his bones. The thoughts of righteousness are just. That's good, that's good. We want, we want to focus. Let's go ahead, Proverbs 17 and 4. A wicked doer gives heed to false lips, and a liar giveth ear to a naughty tongue. 
Whoso mocketh the poor reproacheth his maker, and he that is glad at all calamities shall be unpunished. And one, la one last one, then we're going to take our seat. Proverbs 18 and 22. Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtain the favor of the Lord. Well, how do we reconnect? Is to remember the love that we should have for each other. Remember the vows that we made. It's not easy. And it's a struggle at times. The same thing when you're single and you're trying to live for the Lord. And you have that initial excitement for God. And you can be called on and you're doing so much. Something happens along the way. And we forget who God is in this thing. We forget his power that he has to help us through our struggles. And we try to do it ourselves. We're married and we forget when we begin to struggle. And we try to fix it ourselves. And we keep making the same mistakes over and over and over and over and over and over again. And then there are those of us who've been here a little longer. And Solomon said there should be some wisdom that comes with this old age. That sometimes those who should be teaching us don't teach us or they don't try to help us in this situation. You know, when you've been married 50 years, you got something you can share with us. You know, you can tell us some things. Listen, every day was not a bliss day. It was not a happy day. You got to be able to share those moments with us. But some of us try to keep that. And we see our... Listen, when you cripple homes and you rip partners apart, it bleeds over to God's house. The struggles are here. We're not saying we won't be without sin, but we're saying that, listen, God loves us enough that he's trying to save us. And he's saying that these things can help us, but we have to be willing to reconnect to God. We have to be willing to renew our vows to God. Not only to God, but to each other.